Hi, Jen Bio, Dr. Fry here. And this week we are going to look at the heart and examine blood pressure. So I'll just direct your attention to this first picture here, um, showing you that when we are looking at pictures of the heart, we often will look at them in a particular orientation. So anatomic position for the heart is as if the person as if the heart were in a person who is facing you. So for instance, if this is the person, their left is obviously your right because they're facing you. And so that is the same for the heart. The left side of the heart is on your right because you're facing the part, the person, okay? So as just to orient you, um, this is the left side of the heart. This is the right side of the heart. Obviously the top and the bottom, the apex comes to like almost a little bit of a point here. You've got lots of blood vessels that are coming out um, the, the superior portion, the top portion of the heart. And you will see this in person when we look at it in lab this week. So I'm going to move to the next slide. You should be familiar with the pathway that blood takes as it moves through each of the four chambers of the heart and then travels to the lungs, as well as out to the body and out to the brain. So we're gonna go through those now. So we're gonna start here at the right atrium. Okay, so again, this is the um, individual's right, your left. Um, the right atrium is the topmost portion on the right side, it's a cavity. It's a little bit smaller than the right ventricle. So blood will flow from the right atrium into the right ventricle through a valve called the tricuspid valve. And this blood, as you can see from um, the coloration of this picture is that is deoxygenated. So it needs to head to the lungs to pick up oxygen. So it's gonna travel from the right ventricle out through the pulmonary trunk and then to the pulmonary arteries. There's one that's gonna go to one lung over here and another one, another pulmonary artery traveling to the other lung. So from there, it's going to pick up oxygen um, and then it will return to now our left side of the heart. It's gonna enter into the left atrium through pulmonary veins. And there's one here, there's one here, there's also one over here coming from the other lung, okay? And they're gonna enter into our left atrium. And then the blood will flow from that chamber into the left ventricle through the bicuspid or mitral valve. And there's also some within um, this section between the, two, between the two atria and ventricles, there are these little tendons, chordae tendinae, and papillary muscles, which are in the walls of, the inside walls of the chamber, um, which allow for opening and closing of that valve so that um, the flow of blood is controlled and not leaking from one chamber to the next, okay? So as it passes then through the bicuspid valve, it will enter into the left ventricle. And from here then, we've got oxygenated blood, we have to pump it out to the body and to the head. And so that's where it travels from the left ventricle. It's gonna go up through the aorta um, and out to the body and to the head. There are different branches that come off of the aorta. So all of that is oxygenated blood that's traveling to all the cells of our body, okay? And then after it has done its job, it's released oxygen to the different cells of the body. Um, it will travel back through veins and from the head, the blood coming back now deoxygenated from the head, it will enter the right atrium through the superior vena cava. And from the body, from the rest of the body, it's gonna enter the right atrium through, front, through the inferior vena cava, okay? And then the cycle begins again, okay? Gotta go back to the lungs, then return to the heart before going out to the rest of the body, okay? All right, so that's the pathway of blood that, the, um, that is taken uh, in mammals to oxygenate and um, be moved through the body, okay? So this next slide is a picture of an actual heart. You'll look at one in lab this week and you should be able to make out the different ventricles. So left ventricle, 
and right ventricle. It's been cut in half. Um, so you've got right ventricle and left ventricle. It's been cut and split open like a butterfly sort of. And then of course you should also be able to recognize the left atrium and the right atrium. Um, the right atrium would be sort of up here, but because of the cut, it doesn't look like it's, it's apparent on this picture. Um, you should know the different blood vessels that we just talked about in the last slide. And the best way I think to actually see these when you're looking at the heart is you can, we'll have probes, little um, dissecting needles that we can stick in through the vessels because individually the vessels are very hard to distinguish unless you know where they're going to or coming from. So if you can stick a probe through a particular blood vessel and see that it goes to the left ventricle, then if you know the pathway of blood, the pathway of blood takes through the heart and through each of the chambers and through different vessels, you should be able to determine which blood vessel you're looking at by knowing where it goes to or where it's coming from. Okay, so if you were to stick a probe through a vessel and it terminates at the left ventricle, then you know it has to be the aorta, for example. Okay. All right, moving to the next slide. Um, we are also going to look at heart rate and blood pressure in addition to anatomy of the heart. So heart rate is the number of beats that your heart makes per minute. We usually measure it per minute. And you do this by um, locating your radial pulse, which is on the inside of your wrist. You want to use your middle and index finger uh, to take it. You don't want to use your thumb because sometimes you can pick up a little bit of a pulse through your own thumb, so you get conflicting information there. You want to locate your radial pulse on the inside of your wrist. It's usually on the thumb side, okay? And you should be able to feel your pulse there. Um, and then you can either count the number of beats per minute, or you can count the number of beats per 30 seconds and multiply by two. Or if you really want to be crazy, you can multiply by four after having counted the number of beats for 15 seconds. Okay, so it's pretty simple. You should be able to locate your own your own pulse and take your pulse uh, pretty readily. Um, so the entire uh, cardiac cycle is what we call is the term we use to describe the sequence that starts with a contraction and pumping of blood out to the body or out to the lungs. And then relaxation, which is when the chambers of the heart are in their filling stages. And then the cycle begins again. So the contraction phase we refer to as systole and the relaxation phase is diastole. Could also be pronounced systole or diastole. Um, and this is where you get the term systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure, which are two measures which we'll look at in just a minute. Um, that represent a person's blood pressure. Okay. All right, so blood pressure, like I said, the first, it's usually represented by one number over another number. So say 120 over 80 is often given as a person's blood pressure, a healthy individual's blood pressure. So systolic blood pressure is that first number, 120 in our example. Um, this is the maximum pressure in the arteries when the heart is in its contracting phase. So if you remember that contraction phase is called the systole. That's of course why we call the first number that is representing the pressure that is exerted on that blood moving through the arteries when the heart is in its contraction phase. Okay, systolic blood pressure, pushing blood out to the body. Now, when the heart is in its relaxing phase, relaxation phase, um, the chambers are filling Blood's returning to the heart, filling the chambers, moving from one to the next. Um, this is the, at this point, there's a lower pressure on the blood because there is, the heart is not actively pushing. It's not actively contracting. contracting. So it's going to be a lower number. The pressure is going to decrease because the heart is not currently pushing it out. Okay, so the diastolic blood pressure is always going to be a lower number than the systolic blood pressure. And this is the pressure in the arteries when the heart is in its filling stage, okay? So if you look at the picture here, you're seeing um, with each of these peaks, we're looking at the pressure in a systole, in a contracting uh, part of the cardiac cycle. And then the low, the, the dip, is the pressure in the arteries during the heart's filling relaxation stage, okay? So systolic blood pressure, is the peak, diastolic 
is the trough. Okay, so you're also going to see that within a particular artery, you're usually gonna have a higher blood pressure um, when it is closer to the heart, when the, the artery is closer to the heart. As blood flows then into veins, which are obviously further away from the heart and are now returning, the blood pressure is going to decrease dramatically. You can see here, you've got high blood pressure in your arteries. Um, and then as it moves, as the blood moves to the capillaries and the veins, the pressure decreases just as it moves further from the, from the heart. Okay. Traditionally, blood pressure has been taken with a sphygmomanometer and a stethoscope. Okay, so that's the cuff that if you've gone to the doctor, the cuff he puts on, he or she puts on your arm and inflates and then listens using a stethoscope um, to the brachial artery. Okay, so the brachial artery is running down your arm um, through the inside of your, the inside side of your elbow. And then um, what's actually happening as they inflate the cuff is that it's stopping the flow of blood through the brachial artery. So if you look at the picture here, the cuff has been increased so much that the, it, the pressure from that inflated cuff has cut off the blood flow. So what we know is that the pressure in the cuff is greater than the pressure of the heart moving that blood through your blood vessels. So we have a point where we can recognize as systolic blood pressure because we can hear using our stethoscope that blood flow has been stopped through, you know, through listening to the brachial artery, okay? So I'll explain that in just a minute, but I just want you to understand what's happening. You're, you're cutting off the blood flow as the cuff is increased to a particular pressure. And this pressure is measured in millimeters of mercury, okay? So at this point, we're seeing 120 millimeters of mercury. We have stopped that flow of blood traveling through the brachial artery. Now, if we move to our next slide, um, after the pressure in the cuff is increased, it is gradually decreased, okay? So at some point, blood is going to start to move through that artery again as the pressure in the cuff is released. So when that happens, then, there's this turbulent flow of blood because there's still some constriction on that artery, but it's not enough to completely block it, okay? So we're not cutting off blood flow entirely, but there is a point where systolic blood pressure overcomes the pressure from the cuff. And so some blood flows through that artery. Now it might not be a real smooth laminar flow because the artery is still constricted to a degree, okay? So there's some turbulent flow and this causes vibrations in the artery. And that's actually what we're hearing when we listen to the stethoscope. We're hearing the vibrations of the artery caused by this turbulent flow of blood as it starts to overcome the pressure in the cuff, which is being gradually released, okay? So let's move to our next slide where at a certain point then there is unobstructed flow of blood as the pressure in the cuff is released enough to allow for normal laminar flow of blood, okay? So now we've got blood, as you can see, uh, making its way and successfully traveling through that artery, okay? So this is when you have now stopped any obstruction from the cuff. And now you should not hear any vibrations in that artery because there's no turbulent flow. It's nice, clear, unobstructed blood flow through the artery, okay? So I'm just gonna move to our next slide and just describe these noises that I'm talking about, these, these sounds in the stethoscope. So what I had said before is that without any obstruction, with no constriction of the artery and no pressure in the cuff, Blood is flowing naturally through your, your arteries, right? And we call this laminar flow, okay? It's fastest in the center. It's a little bit slower on the sides, but it should not be um, transverse flow. It shouldn't be jumbled up. It shouldn't be hitting the walls, the arteries, or anything like that. It should be nice, one unidirectional, okay? And when this is the case, there should not be 
sounds produced in the, that you can hear in the stethoscope. Okay, so as you listen to the inside of the little elbow nook, we call this the cubital fossa. Um, as you listen to the person's brachial artery, if there's laminar flow, you shouldn't hear any noises in the stethoscope. Now, as you inflate the, the cuff, the bag, above the person's systolic blood pressure, then like I said, you stop the blood flow. And again, you shouldn't hear any noises because it's stopped. When you start to hear noises, as you decrease the pressure in the cuff, when you start to hear noises, this is because of the turbulent flow. So as you can see in the second picture, you've got some blood flowing through, but it is really rushing to get in. It's being kind of dis disturbed in its blood flow. So as it makes its way through, it might not be a nice clear laminar flow. You've got some jumbling, turbulent flow, okay? And this causes, like I said, vibrations in the artery, which is what you will then hear. So this is what happens between the point where you've reached systolic blood pressure and when you've reached diastolic blood pressure. Okay, so you start to hear noises when systolic blood pressure has um, overcome the pressure in the cuff. And so you mark that as the person's systolic blood pressure. And then when you stop hearing noises, now we can presume again that there's now laminar flow that has resumed. And so that's the person's diastolic blood pressure. Okay, so the, the point at which no more turbulent flow has, has been um, achieved. Okay. And we call these the sounds of Korotkov, the vibrations in the artery. They're called the sounds of Korotkov after the name who, of the man who discovered them and described them. Um, like I said, the first sound is usually referred to as, or is usually measured as the systolic blood pressure. There are different sounds that can be analyzed further as far as different uh, noises you can hear through the stethoscope. But usually when you hear the first sounds, that's when you record, record the systolic blood pressure. When all sounds disappear, that's when you record the diastolic blood pressure. Okay. All right. Moving on uh, to our next slide. Uh, the blood pressure in arteries is going to depend on cardiac output, which is a term that is describing the volume of blood pumped per minute. And it's also going to depend on resistance, peripheral resistance, which is resistance to the blood flowing through your arteries. Um, it can be altered by a few different things, including constriction of the blood vessels or dilation of the blood vessels, okay? And temperature is one factor, activity is another, um, that might act to increase blood pressure. So the reason this happens is that lower temperatures, cold, cause constriction of the arteries. And if there is constriction of the arteries, this is going to raise a person's blood pressure. So to try to overcome that constriction, we need to get blood through, right? Blood pressure is going to increase, okay? So in lab this week, we're gonna have you look at this concept um, by doing an ice water um, exercise and taking your blood pressure um, while your hand is in ice water. Now, I'll also mention, I forgot to mention before, I described to you the traditional method of taking blood pressure with a cuff, blood pressure cuff, sphygmomanometer, and a stethoscope. Because of COVID this year, we're having you use a wrist cuff. Okay, so you're gonna use a, a wrist cuff and do it on yourself. Whereas normally we'd have you work in partners, in pairs, and do it uh, on each other, take each other's blood pressure. So if you ever get a chance down the road to use a sphygmomanometer and a stethoscope, go ahead and do it. Try to, try to do the process that I've just described to you. I think it would be a worthwhile activity. But because of COVID, we're going to have you do your own. Um, you're going to use a cuff. Um, and like I was starting to say, we're going to do this in a couple different scenarios, one of which is ice to see if it does in fact increase your blood pressure. Um, different positions, body positions will also affect your blood pressure. If you are standing, for instance, your heart has to work harder to get blood pressure moving, to get your blood moving against the force of gravity, right? If you're standing up, it's got to work a little bit harder than if you're laying down because there's less gravitational pull to work against, right? So blood pressure changes in response to body position, temperature, and the other factor I'd mentioned was activity. So obviously if you're working harder, um, blood pressure can also increase to meet the needs, meet the demands of your cells. Okay, 
Um, normal blood pressure is rough for a young, healthy individual is about 120 over 80. Um, with age, this tends to increase, and there are a lot of other factors that tend to increase blood pressure. Um, over being overweight or obese, smoking, um, lack of activity, too much salt or alcohol, like I said, age, genetics, uh, disease, um, these can all increase blood pressure. And I think I'd shown in the picture in the last one, um, constrictions of the blood vessels could also uh, increase your uh, blood pressure as well. So high blood pressure is currently, I believe described as a blood pressure of 140 over 90 or higher. This is known as hypertension. And then anything between 120 over 140 is considered pre, anything over 120, but not yet 140 is considered pre-hypertension. Um, so maybe not treated, but at least sort of the clinician would be on the alert for hypertension. Okay. All right, so for this week's lab, we are looking at the heart. You're not gonna dissect it. We're gonna have one in lab for you to look at though. You should be able to identify the four chambers of the heart, the different valves. So we want you to know particularly the tricuspid and the bicuspid valves, uh, the chordae tendineae and papillary muscles, which are uh, working in conjunction with those valves to allow for blood flow to move from one chamber to the next. The interventricular septum, I forgot to actually point this out, but I will, uh, is right here. This uh, thick uh, muscular section in between the ventricles. So the interventricular septum, the division between the two ventricles, um, as well as major blood vessels that I had described and that are also in your lab manual. Like I said, you're gonna look at heart rate and blood pressure and you're gonna look at this in different positions. So standing, sitting, laying supine, which is on your back. Um, we're gonna do all that in lab this week and see the changes in heart rate and blood pressure. Uh, also on your radar should be that you have a results section, which you're gonna write on today's, on this week's material. Um, there, this should also include a table and a figure. So you have to write, a, there should be a written part with your results from the activities that we do in lab. And then one table and one figure that correspond to um, a table in the lab manual that you'll, you'll see, I think it's table one. Um, but you should include that in your results section with the results built into the table. And then you need to make a figure, which is a graph. You're gonna do a bar graph um, demonstrating some results from the icing and the jogging and how that affects your heart rate and blood pressure. Okay. So we will be able to talk about that more when we gather results. I can show you examples in lab of what it should look like. Um, and then also I want you to be aware that the following week we have our osmolarity lab, which is the P lab. So before you come to lab for the for the two hours prior to coming to lab, we ask that you not eat, drink, or urinate if you can. So for instance, if you need to be in lab at eight o'clock, if you can like get up at six o'clock or hold your pee um, until you come to lab, we'll collect it as soon as you get to lab, I'll give you cups, you can, you can go to the bathroom. Um, but we ask that you not eat, drink, or urinate for two hours prior to lab, okay? If you have any health conditions, if you're diabetic or something, obviously take care of your health. Don't do anything that would, that would injure yourself. Okay. All right. On that note, I will see you guys soon. Um, hope you guys got out to enjoy the nice weather a little bit this week and, um, I'll see you on Tuesday. Take care.